Committee Law Recording in Progress. Copyright. Uh, we've uh, participated in calls for comments. It was first introduced as a single bill in Parliament in around 2015. In 2015. <laughs> And also, uh, when the bills were processed separately uh, yeah. in 2017, from 2017 to 2022. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Saipal agrees that the Copyright Act and the Performance uh, Act need to be updated for the digital age. The submission shows that uh, the bills will not achieve that, however, and even harm the authors. If I might just share my with your permission. Thank you, Chair. Now, our written submission was compiled by members of the Institute's uh, Copyright Law Committee, who are attorneys and advocates who practice in the specialist field of copyright law. Our written submission is extensive. It's almost 100 pages long. Uh, our comments are organized into 28 thematically related topics, uh, each spanning a set of provisions in the Copyright Amendment Bill or the performance of these provisions that most of the new sections and amendments speak to a greater We're not. Such a comprehensive uh, submission says, and the simple reason for this is that all concerns about constitutionality and compliance with international treaties. The National Assembly deliberately limited the scope of further public participation to the President's reservations. This was despite protests from numerous stakeholders and guidance from a judgment of the Constitutional Court. With the bills not being fit for purpose and now being dealt with under Section 76 of the Constitution, the NCOP and, by extension, the Select Committee must consider the extensive range of problems that apply across all of the provisions of the bill. Now, unlike our earlier submissions, this submission does not raise our concerns about procedural omissions relating to the bills as a self-standing topic. These concerns include the National Assembly's accepting the bills without a proper economic impact assessment under government's own internal rules its reliance on the advice of a single group of stakeholders to support the bills, and a history of short and inadequate notice periods uh, for comments, and also the, the limitations placed on the scope for comments that I've just mentioned, and our position in relation to these concerns remain unchanged. Now, as we will not have sufficient time for me today to speak in detail on all of the key issues we identified, uh, this presentation aims to provide a very high level overview and to provide some practical guidance and uh, should select committee members wish for the Institute to provide a more comprehensive legal briefing uh, or a workshop on the issues, I'd be very glad to do so. protections to topics were expressly raised by the president in his referral back of the bills 
uh, yet very few changes were made to them. And there's no, there was no report uh, to the president as to why they were considered to be in order. Other contentious provisions are the non-waivable statutory royalty entitlements uh, for authors and performers to receive royalties and shares and gross profits of uh, copyright owners. The 25 year limitation on the term of assignments for all literary and musical works and also on the transfer of performers uh, rights and the blanket contract override provision, uh, as well as uh, the overly broad regulatory powers granted to the minister uh, to arbitrarily limit contractual freedom. Uh, our submission also found numerous problems with other provisions, uh, which ranges from unconstitutional deprivation of property uh, and non-compliance with international treaties to uh, simple and, and basic drafting errors that remain in the bill. Now, in undertaking an exercise as complex as an extensive amendment of copyright and related rights legislation, we expect the from the government that proposes uh, evidence-based legislation. Instead, the conceptualization and the drawn policy. There was no proper socioeconomic impact assist assessment system or, or sales report, uh, the absence of which opens provisions in the bills to many unintended consequences. And there does not even seem to be a single published a policy document underlying the bills. A key flaw in the drafting seems to be that the drafters tried to apply a quick fix solution to identified and perceived problems by simply extrapolating new rights and exceptions that apply to one class of works across all works and across all industries in an arbitrary one size fits all solution or approach, I should say, not solution. The application of copyright impacts uh, in practice on a, on a broad range of commercially unrelated industries, uh, some of which are shown here on the screen for illustration. Each industry sector and also its subsectors depend on copyright in different ways to finance and secure investment for new creative content production projects. And they operate with different rights management and remuneration models that are driven by market specifics in a sector and also consumer demand in each sector. Now legislative intervention in one industry needs a solution that is not replicated without reason into other industries where the same problems do not exist. The extrapolation errors in the bill alone results in easy fixes to the legislation simply not being possible. Now, for example, uh, with the new section 7A, uh, the statutory entitlement to an unwaivable royalty for artists who are makers of artistic works, having been largely inspired by the needle time provisions for music sound recordings that exist in section 9A of the act, it serves no purpose to try to fix the provisions in 7A if the circumstances relating to needle time just do not exist in respect of artistic works, which they don't. Chair, the supposed uh, benefit of section 7A is just an illusion. 7A will, will not bring economic benefits for creators of most kinds of artistic works. Another example is the erroneous miscasting of a 25 year reversion right for musicians, as was recommended in the uh, Copyright Review Commission report originally. And in the bill, it turned into a limit on the term of all assignments of copyright in all literary and musical works. Now, this also affects, for instance, the assignment of rights in computer source code, which is a literary work when the reversion right recommended in the CRC report did not intend to extend its application beyond the music industry, yet this was done in the bill. So the root problems with the bills is that it was drafted largely based on an ideo ideological perspective, unsupported by policy or assessment, that copyright is an obstacle that should be overcome to 
advance technological innovation, education and research objectives in South Africa. Uh, this was stated by the DTI at a rather extraordinary event that it co-hosted with Google and the Freedom of Expression Institute a week before the first public hearings on the bill uh, in 2017. Now at this event, DTI unveiled that it decided to adopt a user-centric approach to copyright protection based on research that it conducted that revealed that copyright is a trade barrier that is, that it is not an economic tool for development. Now, this is an alarming statement to make considering that copyright is the very foundation on which trade is initiated and facilitated in all of our copyright industries. The underlying of, of research uh, that informed the DTI's policy shift uh, was not published for public consideration and comment. Uh, it was not informed by comprehensive stakeholder engagement in, in the affected industries or a proper economic impact assessment. And the outcome of this was a copyright bill that proposes to turn existing, the existing copyright law framework on its head through the introduction of arguably the broadest and the most invasive regime of new copyright exceptions of any copyright law in the world. There was uh, even talk of a novel concept of so-called user rights, which were cast as copyright protections in many instances. And even though the casting of these provisions as user rights has been abandoned, the slogan was simply reformulated as recreator rights or even creator rights. And as a client policy position of a hybrid model of copyright exceptions grounded in fair use. Mr. Chair, the, the, there was no material change to the copyright exceptions that had their origin in the now abandoned user rights slogan. Uh, and that's despite fierce opposition by the overwhelming majority of creative industry stakeholders and serious concerns raised consistently from the onset from the uh, legal fraternity. Um, the Institute is not opposed to new copyright exceptions per se. There is evidentiary and legal support for an extended personal use exception, also an exception for temporary reproduction as part of a mechanical process to enable transmission of copyright works in a network of computers. The Institute fully supports the introduction of a new exception for the blind and visually impaired that would enable South Africa's accession to the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, but the Institute also counsels the NCOP to take heed of the, the implications of the Constitutional Court's recent decision in the Blind SA case for why it did not direct that the bill's new Section 19D be read into our law. We respectfully submit uh, that the National Assembly's Portfolio Committee erred when it took the decision to attempt to fix the errors in the, uh, in the bill in committee. Um, and not rejecting the fundamentally flawed bills at that early stage after the 2017 public hearings. In the process, the Portfolio Committee inadvertently introduced new problematic provisions that were not subjected to economic impact assessment or full stakeholder consultation, uh, notably the new statutory royalty entitlements for authors of literary and musical works, uh, visual artistic works and also performers featured in audiovisual works. Now, it's our expectation that if the bills are persisted with, then it's copyright exceptions and the failure to protect technological protection measures, as raised in the president's referral decision, at the very least will be referred to the constitutional court, and thereby adding probably another two years to a process that has already lasted six years from when the bills were introduced in parliament as separate bills and 12 years from the date the, the Copyright Review Commission handed its report to the minister. Now, if the constitutional court were then to find the bills uh, to be unconstitutional, which we think is quite possible in respect of the bills as they stand now, it'll be necessary to return to the drawing board, which will be a major setback because the NCOP is processing the bills in terms of section 76 of the constitution, 
We understand that the options of the NCOP are limited to the process made provision for in a constitution, uh, namely to accept, uh, reject, or counter-propose a new bill. We contend that the NCOP should not accept the bills for any number of the reasons we have given in our written submission. The NCOP could uh, counter-propose with other bills and uh, come to a mediated solution with the National Assembly, but without evidence and proper legal advice that has been lacking so far, uh, we do not see this as a practical solution. It is our recommendation that the bills be rejected and that they be allowed to lapse in Parliament. Government should be asked to write new bills that do not suffer from the same flaws and that they follow the correct intra-governmental procedures, notably the uh, socio-economic impact assessment system, the intellectual property policy of the Republic of South Africa, phase one of 2018, and taking counsel from the about to be reconstituted Standing Advisory Committee for Intellectual Property. Seipel suggests that once the bills are rejected, that the revision of the, the Act could take place swiftly and in two stages. The first stage should be to amend the Copyright Act in limited respects and to replace the Performance Protection Act. The amendments to the Act uh, of the Copyright Review Commission and to introduce amendments to align the Act with the WIPO Copyright Treaty uh, and the Marrakesh Treaty. And in as much as there's the urgent need for new exceptions for the reproduction right for the benefit of educational institutions and libraries having a public character, the Minister can introduce them instantly by regulation under Section 13 of the Act. A new uh, Performers Protection Amendment Bill could be drafted for proper alignment with the WIPO Performances and Phonograms Treaty, WPPT, and, and also the, the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances that would grant legal protection also to Indigenous performances and performers of uh, Indigenous works. Now, with the work that has already been done, it should be possible to compile such bills and process them through Parliament quite quickly. And then stage two of the process would involve an in-depth revision of the Copyright Act um, that could perhaps even be to such an extent that the bill proposes a replacement of the current Act. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you for your kind attention, uh, Mr. Chair and Honourable Members, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Hollis, for the uh, comprehensive response. Let me uh, identify from the floor. Uh, I see there are some uh, points. Uh, raised by Honorable uh, Boshoff on the on the on the uh, on the platform, uh, the twenty-five year element, if elected, will, will prevent any party from agreeing to very rights that will be bred among the girl. So, in other words, the use of love becomes a creature. Uh, let's 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 just confer ourselves to that. Uh, I think you might comment because look, I think we 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 we, we quite, we quite uh, uh, appreciate the the, the the trust of your presentation, uh, Mr. Hollis, uh, and uh, it's very detailed indeed uh, because it also. Uh, uh, it just comments on sets of provisions in the principal subject, which is quite detailed, and we also identify subjects that have not been covered by the Copyright Amendment Bill. And uh, uh, you, uh, you, 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 uh, uh, in your recommendation, you also make some recommendation. And uh, what is quite important for that is that uh, uh, we must reject the bill. Uh, and uh, the parliament should allow the bills to have in terms of that, in terms of your 
chapter of 761a and the other constitution. That is, that is the trust. It's a, you are saying that we need to conceptualize. But I think that is the, the essence of, uh, of, of, of what we are saying. But key to that, we are saying that uh, uh, there was no uh, socioeconomic economic study, uh, but also the policy that guides the I think that is a trust. Uh, any comment on that? To that? Mr. Chair, comment from my side. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the part of the problem with the bill is that you know it's there's a lot of good intention with it, but the manner it was drafted, like I mentioned, the extrapolation, the, the sort of identification of an issue in the music industry, and then trying to to simply apply that solution across all other industries. Now, when one looks at uh, so obviously the, the the core focus of the uh, the 25 year reversion was because of the CRC report, the recommendations made therein in 2011, that we need to look at how we um, uh, musicians deal with their rights, especially at the beginning of their careers, so that under specific circumstances, they can potentially get their rights back. Now, instead of that translating into the law, all of a sudden, of, of the, there's a limitation placed of 25 years on all assignment of literary and musical works. Now, to give you a quick example, if I'm a musician and I'm writing for film and television, where it's very important for the producer to consolidate all the rights in a project before they can sell it on and, and actually commercialize it. If I were approached and uh, offered a large sum of money to compose a new piece of music for a new blockbuster movie, but in return, I must assign my rights for the full duration of the copyright in the work. I would not be able to do that deal. So clearly that lack of flexibility would even harm the very people that it's supposed to, uh, to protect. And then if you apply that proposed solution across all other industries without impact assessment, without intention really, uh, so there wasn't an original intention to do so, but to say, actually, this is a good one fit for the music industry, so it must work for everyone else. It can lead to disastrous consequences of, uh, in, other, in, in other industries as well. And if you look at how reversion rights are dealt with in other legislation, for instance, in America's copyright law, they've got a very sophisticated uh, system that deals with of a process so that it's not everybody after 25 years that terminates the agreement, but only in circum specific circumstances where a musician were to assign their rights to, let's say, a recording company or a publishing company. And after a certain period of time, if the 35 years in America, that musician feels that uh, uh, he wishes to renegotiate terms, that construct allows that renegotiation to take place. It's not just a blanket termination. And also importantly, if that music is included in a derivative work like a film or something like that, the musician can't then stop the commercialization of the film after 35 years unless the film producer pays him $10 million. So you can see what a diff difficult construct it is if, if you consider that in today's uh, environment, most creative uh, content production projects of high quality and high investment are multi authored works. There can be a hundred musicians uh, that, that uh, contributed music to a particular, uh, let's call it a movie, or there can be a hundred software developers or gaming developers that contributed towards the production of a work. Now, if at a certain point in time, the person who acquires and invests in that work were to have to renegotiate terms with every single performer, every single extra that appeared in the film, every single person who, create, who contributed musical content, every single person who, who, who wrote source code or who actually uh, contributed a script to a work, it actually turns South Africa into a destination where the, the big investors that will bring the big projects to drive economic development, to drive a, a, a job creation in South Africa, will actually probably look elsewhere to, to uh, produce, to locate these projects where similar restrictions do not apply. And Mr. Chair, this is one issue. There's many other issues as well, as you'll note from uh, the submission. Uh, the contract override provision uh, is, is a very serious limitation on the constitutionally record. What it does is you 
transfer that truth as you will. So what that means is absolutely key because no content creation project is the same. Each one has different nuances and you make the underlying legislative framework, the more unattractive uh, South Africa becomes as in production projects. Um, the, the ministers brought powers to uh, intervene and to set uh, a compulsory standard terms for all copyright contracts is also a major cause of concern. We don't know what that will, uh, how that could look. And what it does is it, it really damages investor confidence because if people are unsure of what the legislative environment will be in the next year or two, um, they will likely invest in another jurisdiction where uh, similar restrictions do not apply. And nowadays, the international, uh, the global environment is intensely competitive, uh, especially in the audiovisual uh, uh, and music and other uh, uh, creative uh, content production of uh, environments. And if it's not, when you make an investment decision to bring a massive project to South Africa that can really assist to, to, to drive economic growth, you don't just look at one country. You will typically have a number of countries that you assess. You do a legal due diligence. And what this bill does is it elevates the risk profile for South Africa to an unprecedented and unnecessary level because the intended benefits uh, that the bill proposes will not, it's, it, it's, there's, it, it will not materialize. So if there's, a, um, if there's any doubt, and we've not even touched on fair use, which, which will uh, turn South Africa's uh, copyright law on its head. Now, I know that the users of works are very, ex uh, of, uh, are very excited about this. The, the, the big tech companies and the, uh, the ones with user uh, upload platforms that actually make use, have made very successful business models on the back of distribution uh, or allowing the distribution by users of music, films, et cetera, published books uh, on platforms. And uh, in instances where the remuneration doesn't necessarily flow back to, or fair remuneration doesn't necessarily flow back to the author. So we understand that the, that the, the large scale users of copyright protected works uh, are quite excited about fair use, but what it means for South Africa's creators. And as we understand it, Government's intention is to legislate to uplift the plight of a vulnerable creative mind when a group of musicians went to the office of President Zuma uh, to say, please help us. You know, it's been seven years since needle time royalties were introduced back into our law. We haven't seen any money. That led to the Copyright Review Commission report. So we all expected uh, a law that will bring us in line with the digital age, but also look after our creators. And what, we, what happened, that policy shift that I mentioned at the DTI to say, hang on a sec, we've, we've decided to rather go to a user-centric approach. Yes, that will help educational institutions to a certain extent. Yes, that will help government uh, to a certain extent where government doesn't want to pay for the works they use. And yes, it will help users in general who, who want to use works but don't want to pay or get authorization from the copyright owners. And what it does for South Africa's authors of books, South Africa's musicians, uh, and, and also all role players, the entire value chain, producers of films, performers featured in films, is that they're in a much worse position than they were ever before if fair use were to replace fair dealing uh, because fair use, and, and let, but there's also a lot of smoke and mirrors. The fair use proposal that is advanced in the bill is not the same as it appears in the United States and the handful, the small handful of, of other countries that have adopted fair use. None of the countries with which South Africa shares common law and legal heritage have actually adopted fair use over fair dealing despite extensive uh, consultations and a lot of uh, uh, that some spanning for years. We're looking at countries like uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the European Union. None of their 27 member countries have fair use. You look at Australia. So what these people do who promote fair use, first of all, uh, they are uh, deceiving you if they say that it's the same as the United States. The fair use proposal in the bill, as a matter of fact, is much broader 
and it contains even different criteria. There's the four factor test, and there's a very troubling uh, inclusion in the in the uh, in the in the bill that replaces the fourth factor of the American version, and and with a new one that says you must assess this as in the U.S. You you have to look at the effect on the potential market or the value of the work. What that means is that if you make a work that doesn't directly substitute the work, like for instance, an indigenous knowledge work that is not necessarily originally made for uh, online use and exploitation. And a tech firm would then to adapt it or somehow without permission use it in a digital environment. They can argue that we didn't substitute your work because your work was never created for the digital environment. That change has not been subjected to any economic impact assessment. It is not actually backed by policy. It has not been properly explained. So, so what, you, what you have to keep in mind during these sessions is, number one, the fair use proposal here is not the same as, as, as America. It also doesn't incorporate any of the checks, the counter checks and balances. So in the United States, you've got uh, statutory and punitive damages, well, which... Just uh, <laughs> I think we got the size of the trust. Uh, for well, it, it's all it's all in our submission, Mr. Chair. So, so I encourage you to read it and uh, uh, please get in touch with us if there's any clarifications needed. Yes, yes. I think for thanks, thanks, thanks for that uh, clarity. Uh, you were indeed went to town in terms of making it much more easier for us to to understand where you come from. I think that was the purpose of of probing. And thanks uh, uh, on behalf of the committee for honoring the invite uh, and uh, uh, indeed the views uh, of, of, of your organization, South African Institute of Intellectual Property Law is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, honorable members. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, we will now uh, move on also and uh, invite the Commercial Producers Association, uh, CPA, and the Association for Communication and Advertising uh, to make their presentation. It is a joint submission. Uh, uh, I'm not sure who's leading the team, but I think they will do the that, that That would be me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, on, on behalf of, this, of uh, the ACA. And I have uh, my colleague who is joining me. I'm not sure if is here uh, from the CPA. Um, Bobby, are you here? I am. I've got my video on. I'm not sure if you can ah, see me. Excellent. Excellent. So, me? Mr. Chair, it will be it will be between the two of us uh, as we make the submission. And, and thank you very much to you, Chair, and uh, esteemed committee members for giving us this opportunity to uh, express um, our view on, on on this process. And and this then this this view largely for, for, from our perspective is one of seeking clarity uh, around the confusion that we have as, as, as the outcome of the bill uh, and, and the un and unintended consequences that we foresee as a result of the, uh, the revision of the bill, but also to provide clarity to yourselves as a committee around how we work and how the ecosystem, the advertising and, and production ecosystem works uh, so that you've got enough information uh, to do the work that you need to do. So that, that's really our intention for our submission in, in a nutshell. My name is Leo Manne, a board member at the ACA, and I'm also the managing director of a member agency of the ACA. I also happen to sit on a committee uh, in the ACA that deals with self-regulation and education of the production and audiovisual advertising commercials. Uh, and as uh, I said earlier, I'm with my colleague, um, is Bobby M, and she comes from the CPA, and you'll, she'll speak briefly about the CPA. Yes, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much, Honourable Chair and uh, Select Committee members for the invitation today. My name is Bobby M. I'm the Executive Officer of the Commercial Producers Association. We work in the advertising industry along with the ACA to produce the television commercials that you see on your television screens. Um, I'm going to be addressing the second part of the presentation, and Leo is going to be taking you through the introduction. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby. Now, as part of the ACA, we represent the interests of uh, various advertising agencies in South Africa, and perhaps we're the foremost representative body uh, in the country that represents this, this segment of the market uh, and, and profession. 
The ACA is a strong, strong advocate for self-regulation. In fact, we have been a, a founding member of the ARB, which, um, um, which is the Advertising Regulatory Board for the last 50 years. And that's how strongly we hold the importance of self-regulation in this industry to make sure that there is fairness and um, uh, there, is, there is fairness in how we negotiate with all of the players that are, that are in this ecosystem. The ACA, we've got about 61 corporate members uh, and, and 12 individual incubator members, uh, and we're located in Johannesburg, Durban, and in Cape Town. Now, just to give you a, a, a brief sense of how we work between ourselves as the ACA and the CPA, um, just a quick synopsis. We operate uh, on behalf of our clients, and client by clients, I mean marketers, corporate companies, and sometimes even government. Uh, because government, uh, I think, um, uses our services quite extensively to communicate to the public for various reasons, whether it's driving the elections for next year or, is, as it happened in the last two years in COVID, uh, using our services to drive communication around what needs to happen. So that, that's really what our role. We get commissioned by uh, marketers, by corporate companies um, to devise uh, marketing communication uh, for, for their services. Uh, and we in turn then um, reach out to member, uh, members of the CPA who are in the production space to then bring to life some of the ideas that we would have come up with as advertising agencies. And, and in a nutshell, that's how we would work. Um, a lot of the clients largely are based in South Africa, but there are a lot of the agencies also service clients that are international clients that are that that are that are that come from many other places in the world. And um, and it's important. This aspect is is also quite important because it it, it to to uh, a a submission that that was made uh, by Mr. Hollis earlier. It it implement it it has an, a direct Im impact on the viability of the growth of this economy and, and direct foreign investment. Because we provide services to a, a number of corporate companies that come from outside of the territory of South Africa. We as an industry are consistently ranked among the world leaders in creativity and media innovation. And we create a broad range of opportunities for South Africa's creatives, including sustainable jobs, employment, uh, we support trans transformation initiatives and contribute to broader economic uh, um, growth, um, largely by bringing in foreign direct investment um, through um, to, to our shores. Now, I've spoken about self-regulation and how important this to us uh, as, as, as a collective uh, that works in, 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 in this space. Um, the ACA, we support the industry um, because we, we firmly believe that, um, you know, to please excuse me, um, in representing the interests of the performers and including models and actors who are featured in these, in, in these commercials, we work together uh, with other associations in this space. For instance, NAMA, the, the National Association of Modeling Agencies and SAPAMA, the South African uh, Performing Artists Managing Association. And together, we, over the many, many years, that many years that we've worked together, um, we have, come together to ensure that there is um, fair discussion and negotiation around performer remuneration, making sure that there is a standardization around commercial production contracts to ensure that performers are engaged in our industry on a fair and equitable basis. Um, these standardized contracts and agreed best practices around our remuneration are important due to the nature of the industry, which requires swift and very transparent engagement Largely also because we represent the interest of, of our clients, of our very many clients, and this is their money that we use. And so transparency is such, such an important pillar of how we engage in this ecosystem that I've spoken about and how we use the resources that are given to us by, by, the, by the marketers, by the clients for, that we represent in, in, in executing um, our responsibilities. Um, in fact, this is also in terms of how we engage with the different role players in, in the market. This is something that my colleague Bobby will speak to later on. Just to give you a, a sense perhaps of what the current landscape looks like, um, the advertising and other audiovisual content production industries have become quite intensely competitive. In fact, this is a point that Mr. Hollis spoke to uh, earlier on in, in, in his presentation. 
Uh, and this is largely due to um, how important the this, this, this sector of the market is for, for many developing economies. It, there's a recognition that there is real value that is held by the advertising and production industries for driving foreign direct investment, job creation, broad economic um, growth in countries with thriving creative content production sectors. Um, there is no obligation, however, for these advertisers who are globally based to produce the commercial work that they, they, that, that, that they give to us in the territory in which the broadcast is intended. Uh, a lot of the decisions that they make on whether they would uh, you know, use our resources, both from an advertising agency point of view, but also from a production industry point of view, is um, rests on a number of factors. And one of those factors is, do we provide an existing viable infrastructure as a country? Do we provide cost and value for money in the work that we do? And are there available locations? Is there good weather and long hours of light? In fact, it's, it's no mistake that in, in, in the case of the US that uh, Hollywood is in the Western part of, of, of that part of the land, largely because of, of great weather and, 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 and the long hours that's provided by the, by the sunlight to produce a, a lot of the shoots outdoors. And of course, there's a, there's a number of other interests, but more importantly, which is what brings us here, and, and is part of our contribution to this conversation, is uh, it's important that there is provision of a legislative environment that is conducive to the production process. And, and that's what a lot of marketers, corporate companies would look to in making decisions around whether they, they uh, invest directly in, in this country via ourselves as advertising agencies, or through the production companies that then provide services for us to bring the, our ideas to life. Um, currently, we are ranked as one of the top providers of these services in the television, commercial filming, and production destinations in the world. And what we don't want to do with the unintended consequences that, that may flow from um, uh, the changes that, that, that are intended in, in, in the bill, that we lose this position in, in the global market as, as, as a desirable destination that has brought so much investment over the last couple of years and created so many jobs for our performers. And, and that's something that we're quite concerned about. And that's why we're here to see clarity around um, what the implications of the, um, the changes that are suggested in the bill would have for us, uh, and for us, of course, to provide the clarity that hopefully will help you will help you make a decision around how to, how to move forward with the, with the process of the amendment of the bill. What we don't want to do, which is one of the unintended consequences, consequences which happened in the USA a long time ago, uh, is, is something that we refer to in the industry as runaway production. Because the the market is and is 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 not certain uh, around uh, legislation and what what companies can expect from South Africa, um, and this is what happened in the U.S. many years ago. A lot of productions uh, went to Canada, went to parts of Europe, went to Australia, New Zealand, and we were beneficiaries, uh, coincidentally, of of that runaway production as South Africa, and not just in the advertising space, but also in the film production space as well, um, because we have become a really great destination uh, for various reasons that I've pointed out. Um, now, some of the key reasons that we have um, concerns over in terms of the amendment that's been proposed um, in, in, in the Copyright Act and the Performers Protection Act um, is, and, 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 and Mr. Hollis spoke to it, is the absence of a meaningful impact assessment around the implications of the proposed changes in the bill. And, and we're quite concerned about this for, for, for a number of reasons that I've already pointed out, um, and, and I don't want to um, you know, lo lose any more time talking about them. But we, we've got, um, uh, in terms of the legislative proposals that were designed to address bespoke issues that may exist in one industry, and, and this is a point that perhaps I want to, to, to dwell on a little bit, is um, there's a slide that Mr. Hollis had that I think explains exactly the challenge that we've got as an advertising and production industry, is that the intended uh, the intent actually that that of, of the legislative changes that are proposed come from the fact that there is a homogenization of the creative industry um, where um, we're all as part of this creative industry are painted with the same brush 
but nothing is further from the truth. We are so nuanced and different in the way that we execute our expertise, but also our different needs uh, as the different sectors in the creative industry. And I, I think being treated and, 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 and treating this amendment of the bill uh, in, in a one size fits all is, is a concern that we'd like to raise um, the, the two, two, to yourselves uh, and a concern for us, particularly as, a spe as this specific industry that we would like to raise. And, and this coming to a very specific point around royalty and uh, entitlements. Now, when it comes to royalties, royalties really approve to creators of IP, uh, whether you're a musician, a filmmaker, um, um, a, a, a fine artist, uh, whether you are Nelson Makamo, for instance, now royalties accrue to people that have created assets or that that um, that, that that are registered as, as, as IP. In in the space that we work with, um, you know, we uh, we use we are third party users of these assets for which we pay fair rights um, a, a remuneration for. So, for instance, in an, in an ad, if there's a piece of music that needs to be used, we negotiate with the rights holder and we pay fair usage for, for, for the use of that right. And in the instance, for instance, of performers, uh, and I've spoken about how we work and how we've been working over the years with the many different associations, NAMA, SAPAMA, PMA, uh, and, 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 and many others, uh, there is something that my colleague will speak to uh, quite, quite, quite extensively around usages uh, and performance fees, and, and that accounts for um, uh, paying um, fair um, a remuneration to performers that are involved. So the two things really where, where we get quite confused from a royalty entitlement point of view is, firstly, we pay for, um, for usage of IP and, and, and assets that, that are created by by owners, whether the music or art or any piece of work that 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 may be referenced in in the work that we do, and in the case of artists and relationship that we have built over the years, with years, and that process has worked really well for us. So we we're not quite certain how um, the changes that are proposed in the amendment bill how that will affect us. As, as an industry because these areas have already been covered uh, proactively through engagement over the years uh, between us. Um, from, and if, and if the, the royalty changes do, do come to light, uh, there would be an administrative burden that we'd have to sit with, but perhaps this is something that I do want to focus on until we get absolute clarity as an industry, whether these royal, these proposed changes from an, a royalty entitlement point of view will affect us as an industry for, for the reasons that I've highlighted. Um, and then there is, of course, a concern we've got around mandatory reporting obligations, um, criminalizing these for non-reporting. Um, if you think about the kind of product that we um, that that we produce uh, in in partnership, of course, with our production uh, company um, our partners through the CPA, um, it, it becomes um, quite tricky to think about how how we're going to report uh, all of these assets um, to the extent that the legislation is proposing. Uh, it makes absolute sense if you're a musician and your music is played on many different stations, and for that reason, you need to know what royalties accrue back to you. For us who are producing assets that are not uh, commercial entities in their own that draw uh, revenue, it's, it, it becomes quite confusing how this will impact us as an industry. And hence the clarity is sought uh, from my end around how this would work or even affect us. Um, Self-regulation, just in, 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 in conclusion, it is something that has carried us for many, many years and has served us well as an industry. And, and we believe that this is something that, that's not broken and that does not need to be fixed uh, um, by the changes that may, um, uh, may affect us when the, the, when the build amendments are meant to, to uh, address specific things uh, in the creative industries, particularly perhaps with musicians, and the impact of the digital changes that have happened and are impacting how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. But where we're concerned in terms of an, as an industry, we're not quite sure how these will impact us. And uh, if, when, you, when you understand how we work, in the way that we've explained it, in the way that my colleague Bobby will explain in a moment, um, it, it becomes quite uh, confusing for us 
how the amendments will, 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 will affect us as an industry. Thank you, thank you, Liu. Uh, you are then giving over to your colleague. Yeah. Thank Great, you. thank you, Leo, and uh, thank you everybody for having us once again. Um, before I start, I'd just like to say that obviously the advertising sector uh, is represented here today by the ACA and the CPA, two organizations uh, whose memberships work very closely together. But we're also part of a wider group, which is the audiovisual sector in South Africa. And we do have a lot of concerns. Our specific concern is obviously around Section 8A. Uh, which is around um, royalties, statutory royalties to performers. And as Leo has mentioned, there are many questions as to uh, you know, how far the law goes, uh, how to interpret it. And it's uh, basically uh, clarity around that that is missing and um, obviously an issue of concern for us. Um, I think um, part of the problem is, is that um, only sort of one side of the story has been heard by government. Um, Last week or two weeks ago at the Gauteng Legislature, they put together a presentation which said the bill will give artists and performers certain protections and for the first time ever the right to earn fair, fair royalties. Uh, we're going to show now how we actually already pay royalties in the advertising sector. I'm going to give you some examples because I think there's always a lot of talk about you know, why the bills won't work and why they shouldn't be, uh, come in, but um, I think it's important that we as industry provide examples of how we work so that we can actually demonstrate that to government. I'd just like to echo what Leo and Stephen Hollis have said. I think this uh, one size fits all application is a very dangerous thing. Uh, the industries, the different sectors are very deeply nuanced, even though we straddle advertising and AV as production companies, there are huge differences in the way we work to when compared to um, production companies that make feature films and other type of content, and also to advertising agencies. Uh, so I'd like everybody um, just to please bear that in mind. Um, uh, before I start, I'd also just like to talk a little bit about local and service work. You'll hear these terms often. So when I refer to them, uh, what I really mean is that local is all the commercials that you see that are made for South African consumption. So that's all of our commercials on the SABC, on all of our broadcasters. And then we also have another sector to our industry, which we call the service industry. And the service industry is basically all the international work that comes in from overseas. So foreigners absolutely love making their television commercials in South Africa. We're a very popular destination currently. There are many reasons why we're very good at what we do. So we really attract a lot of business here. And obviously that's very positive for the country because it creates a lot of uh, investment in, into our country. Um, so, I just wanted to clarify that. So obviously speaking about section 8A, I just like to firstly say that, you know, there's been a sort of narrative in the industry that this is a top-down approach where performers are dictated to, where they have, you know, no say over anything. Now you will note that with our submission that we sent in, we sent in two contracts that are used largely in the advertising industry, in the local and in the service side of the uh, uh, market. Uh, and these are not top-down contracts which we have written up. They're actually contracts that have been negotiated with the representatives of talent. So in this case, it's the National Association of Model Agencies, SAPAMA, the PMA, and SAGA themselves. And then also just to say that obviously we don't set down rates. That would be anti-competitive. So we create guidelines that are job-specific, subject to supply and demand, and basically a guideline to actually inform producers on how to quote and also to uh, advise agents about what is deemed acceptable. So what I'm gonna be demonstrating today is just an example of this. I just want to make it very clear that we have different ways of working in the local industry and the service industry. They're not exactly the same. So I've just opted to use an example from our sector of the industry, which is more service international. And I've based these examples on a one day shoot using the PAIC usage tables. The PAIC is the contract that we have put together uh, with obviously collaboration of the agents and which you have copies of. Um, you'll see that the contracts are very substantial. They're not two or three pages. Our contract I think runs to 30 pages. So um, performers are certainly uh, looked after. They definitely are involved in that process to put together these contracts. Uh, it's not a top-down approach from us. So just to show you um, what performers are earning at the moment, um, these obviously are commercial rates. So this is not for television or anything else. This is simply for advertising. These are the daily fees. And you'll see there's something on the right called the usage base rate. So in the international service side of the industry, we use a base rate to calculate what we call usage. 
But if you'll just look through the different types of performers, obviously have a lead, that would be the person who is the leading role, and obviously they would attract the most money. Uh, supporting performer or featured extra, as we call them. Those are people who are recognizable in commercials. You can clearly see their faces and they play an important role. Non-supporting performers are also recognizable, but they play a lesser role. And then obviously we have different categories for teenagers and for children. Uh, and then of course we have uh, people called extras and your background extra is a person who you will see in the background, usually in a large group. So if you think of a commercial where there are a whole lot of people in a stadium, for instance, those people would be your extras. So these are their daily rates, basically, um, and this is what they're earning. And as I say, it's um, very much a negotiation depending on the requirements of each and every uh, commercial. So just to take you forward, I want to show what we call a usage fee. So a usage fee in advertising is almost exactly the same thing as a royalty. So our argument here is that this fee, uh, the usage fee has been paid in the advertising industry uh, well, certainly since before I was in the industry, which is 26 years. So these fees have been around for a long time and they are negotiated. So you may say, what does usage mean? So basically it means the right to use, publish, reproduce, perform, exhibit, sorry, the chair's in the way, so I can't read the end, or deal with the material featuring the performer in the authorized medium for the usage period in, and the usage territory. So firstly, just to say that our contracts are not open-ended. So it's not like a feature film where that feature film is going to be flighted for the next sort of 30 years. Our contracts only last for a year or two and they can be renewed. So obviously with advertising, it's much shorter, it's much sharper. So basically the usage fee is the amount paid to the artist to allow you to use his or her image to endorse your product over a certain period, usually a year, and in a certain territory. So generally speaking, um, South African commercials will fly to only in South Africa. That will be their usage territory. But obviously, when an international company comes here to make a commercial, they will uh, you know, have a different percentage attached to their territory. So what I did is I actually asked um, some of the performers' agents you know, if they thought that we were currently paying the top rates, as illustrated in the last uh, slide. And they said, no, they don't think we are, because South Africa is still uh, struggling a bit post-COVID. So I've actually brought those rates down, just to give you an idea of what people will earn with these current usage fees in place. So if you look at the lead, for instance, I bought the base rate down from uh, 12,000 to 8,000 Rand, and we are calculating the usage fee on 5,000 Rand, which is obviously slightly less. So if one looks at France, for instance, you'll see that that performer would be paid a total of 23,000 Rand, because we apply 300% to France. If you were going to buy all of Africa to fly your commercial throughout Africa, you'd be looking at 400. The USA is 600. Europe is 1,000, and worldwide is 1,600. So as you see, obviously the rates go up incrementally depending on the territories that you're actually flighting this commercial. Uh, so just to show you the, the calculation, we base it on the 5,000 Rand usage fee. We apply 300% to that, and then we add the, the day rate, the day fee, which is 8,000 Rand, and that's how we get our totals. So we wanted to project this to show that, you know, uh, there may be other industries where... Uh, Certainly performers may be exploited, but we don't believe that that is the case in our industry. And this is why we feel strongly that we shouldn't all be painted with the one brush that Leo spoke about earlier, but that there should be cognizance taken of the fact that we believe that we have a fair contractual process and that our rates are fair. And, and you know, for one day of work, you will be getting 88,000 Rand if you do worldwide, basically. So it's not like you're getting paid nothing. You absolutely are being paid what we believe is a fair amount for one day. And as I say, the, the reason why we pay these usage fees is in recognition, you are using that person's image to sell your product. So our argument is that there is already a royalty applied in commercials that uh, is uh, already dealing with that issue. Now, all of a sudden, there's the introduction of a different royalty, which will now need to be calculated in a different way. And a big part of the problem is at this point, we just don't know how that's going to be calculated. And I just want to go on to show you as well that it doesn't that's stop. That's what I said about time. You can wrap up because remember, the two of you had 30 minutes. So. 
<laughs> okay, I'm almost done. I'll run through this very quickly. I just want to show everybody the renewal fee. So this is for Africa. We've used that as our example. And I'm just trying to show you here that over the three years, basically, you will get an increase at 10% uh, for the service industry. But in the local industry, renewals are between 150 and 125%. So you're getting an escalation in uh, your amount that is due to you every year. And of course, you don't work for that amount. It's just coming in because your image is being used. And then I just want to project um, the last slide very quickly. Um, so we've had a lot of discussion about what are the potential implications for the industry should the copyright bill go through. Uh, and I just want to quickly go through them. The marketers are going to have to recalculate day rates to accommodate future royalties. So I think the belief that suddenly all the rates are going to go up is that's not going to happen. What's essentially going to happen is that there's just going to be a reassignment to basically include royalties. So I think the performer's expectation that they're gonna see an increase in rates overnight uh, is, is incorrect. Um, there's also a question around um, uh, extras. And I believe the act doesn't define what a performer is. So we would say extras are performers because they're in front of the camera. They are also going to need to get royalties. So that unfortunately is gonna come out of the budget allocated to performers. Secondly, marketers may make use of available technology to replace some roles. Uh, so people can now be computer generated, and we're already seeing it in some of our local advertising. Um, it's amazing. You actually can't tell the difference. So that's our concern, is that human beings may be replaced by digital images. Number three, international marketers may opt to make the commercials in countries other than South Africa. This would be absolutely devastating to our international service sector. People won't come here, as uh, Stephen and Leo have mentioned, if there is a legislative environment that is not attractive to them. Even more concerning for our local industry is that South African marketers may opt to import international commercials for big brands rather than actually making the commercials here in South Africa. And they might also opt to produce the commercials outside of South Africa. So what I foresee happening if this legislation goes through is our commercials are going to be start to be made in other countries other than South Africa. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention because this, these are the potential unintended consequences for South African advertising agencies, production companies, suppliers, crew, and performers. And you'll see I've underlined performers for emphasis there. And the big concern is the damage to the industry and our reputation could be enormous and take decades to reverse. So we would support the call to basically urgently review this legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Bobby and uh, Liu, for the comprehensive uh, response. We, we got the thrust of uh, uh, what the, the structure is talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, your input. Uh, I'm looking at the child, but because uh, the two of you had, uh, had ample opportunity, uh, I'll just check for members. <laughs> whether they have uh, any any matter that they want to raise. But I think the good thing also is that uh, Neil, when he started, I think the thrust of this presentation more or less mirrored what uh, the South African uh, Institute of Intellectual Properties, what Horis was saying. That's the gist of what we could get right at the beginning that uh, you share, you share, you share commonalities. But uh, we, 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 are, we, we, are, we are quite, quite, quite uh, uh, comfortable. Uh, we understood the trust of the issues that, uh, that, 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 that we can pass. Uh, you also uh, uh, hammered on the issue of the absence of the meaningful uh, economic impact assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, the clarity around uh, the advertising industries bespoke uh, requirements and its production environment, uh, which you have the view that uh, the government would not consider. Uh, and we have a 25 year limitation on all assignments of us that we also need to run to the government uh, in commercial works, including audiovisual works. And then the new statutory royalty entitlements for authors of literary, musical, and visual artistic works, but also the the, the, the issues around uh, the the definition of a performer in the context of an unwaivable statutory royalty entitlement for all performers who appear in audiovisual works. Those are the issues that we raise, but also more than that, 
Uh, you also uh, had an issue with the, uh, the minister's compulsory and standard conceptual terms for all copyright agreements. I think that is the thrust of what he said. Uh, other than that, I think we are happy. Any last word, Mr. Liu? Uh, no, nothing from me except to say thank you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, and um, just to reiterate that it is absolutely important that uh, as a creative industry, um, we're not treated as a, as a homogeneous uh, industry. Yeah. There are various nuances uh, and, and, and those need, would need to be taken into consideration um, in, in, in effecting the, the amendment of the bill. That, 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 thanks, Lou, and your structure and movie for honoring our invite. We definitely uh, uh, learned a lot from uh, the issues that we are conversing, and uh, we will now proceed. Uh, and on behalf of the uh, committee, uh, our gratitude to you for, for, for honoring the invite. We will now move to the next uh, uh, presentation, which will be made by the Dramatic, Artistic, and Literary Rights Organization. The Dalro, Dalro, the platform is yours. Um, thank you, Chair. Thanks, I sir. hope I'm audible. Um, good, good afternoon uh, to the Chair and to the committee as a whole and all participants. Uh, my name is Lazarus Robe. I am the managing director of the Dramatic Literary uh, Rights Organization. Well, I, thank you. I will start with two apologies. Uh, the first being that due to personal and technical uh, reasons, I have not been able to put together a presentation for this uh, uh, committee. However, we have um, submitted a <clears throat> a fairly extensive written submission, which I hope the committee will have the opportunity to go through. The second apology is that I'm not very well, I'm very fluy. And so from time to time, I would be, uh, I'm afraid there will be some disruption with a lot of coughing, which I've been, <clears throat> I've been going through. So my apologies for that. Uh, that said, um, if I can please ask uh, the secretariat to help me just to project the written submission, I will not go through the whole of it, but I will choose uh, and highlight areas of major concern. And um, if you can just go to page two to start off with. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, um, before I even start on what, who Dalro is and what we do, that we support and share the sentiments uh, generally uh, that was presented by Mr. Hollis for with the uh, South African Institute of Intellectual Property Lawyers. We support that sentiment we, in, in the whole and that we are in agreement with most uh, things that were um, expressed therein. Uh, that said, um, we also support obviously what uh, Leo and, and, and Bobby said in, in, a, in a while in the broad sense that the one, one brush, one paint uh, for all does not work. Um, that said, Maybe just some background on Dalro. Dalro is a multi-purpose collective society management agency that brokers um, the use of uh, copyright works between authors, visual artists and publishers on the one hand, and users on the other, mainly uh, high institutions of higher learning in South Africa. So we, 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 we get involved where many rights holders as these classes of rights holders need to authorize the use of a work or, or their works to one user or many works uh, 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 from many countries to, to, this, to one user or where many users want to use a, a, a rights, uh, copyrighted works of either one uh, copyright holder or more. In simple terms, Dalro provides a one-stop shop solution by providing the infrastructure to clear rights before a use takes place in a fair, easy, equitable, and balanced manner. We hold the middle ground between rights of copyright holders, as I said, and users on the other. If you can just scroll down, please.
Uh, the screen doesn't seem to be moving. So, can you our, come to, to Enrico? We are good. Thank you. Uh, if you can just go to page four, I hope I, I'm not going to hold you to everything that's written in the in the. You just maybe scroll to page four, please. So the just to deal with some of the main 